blessing to be here with you again today. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for your goodness, Lord, and your mercy. We just ask your blessing, Father, on this time together. Lord, we ask you to fill us with your spirit, give us wisdom, help us be faithful to you. Lord, help us hear your word as we open your book. Father, thank you for your guidance. Again, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's open our Bibles to Matthew. Chapter 5, begin reading in verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I wanted to read these few verses this morning. Uh, just some of the teachings of Jesus. See tries to instruct us, uh, we can take these verses and just turn them into a law, but the purpose that he gave them is, is for those, for it's the, to have the spirit or the attitude that he would love for us to have, to have the spirit of the Lord. When, you know, we can think about these things and whenever someone asks us to do something or forces us to do something, the first thing that we want to do is bristle and fight against that. We want to resist it. And that's the, what he's trying to teach us here. Instead of having this attitude of resistance, have an attitude of just surrendering to it, to give and what that does is it changes maybe not the situation. A lot of times we're trying to fix the person that's doing this to us. And we think about how wrong they are for asking something special or extra of us. And so our focus goes on them and trying to resist them and trying to, to uh, correct them whenever the real problem is us. And that's what Jesus is trying to work on. He's, whenever we find these things that uh, when someone does us wrong, one of the things that Jesus is trying to teach us or to impart to us is that, and the whole gospel of the kingdom is to rise above the things of this world. To rise above, that's the idea of Christianity. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. Jesus is trying to teach us to rise above this world. So whenever someone slaps us on the cheek, you know, we may be big enough or strong enough or quick enough to really level the playing field or really to straighten that other person out. It may be in our ability to actually overcome them. But that leaves us on the same level as the world. That's how the world responds to things, is to defend ourselves and to take care of ourselves, to protect ourselves. But Jesus is teaching us that 
there is a higher plane that we can rise above. That when someone slaps us on the face, instead of slapping them back, but to, to turn the other cheek, to pray for them, to forgive them. And that's something that we have an opportunity to work on. It says, verse 39 says, but I say unto you, do not resist an evil person. You know, a lot of times that we have the idea that the way you fix an evil person is to really put them in their place, to really set them straight, to fix them. You know, if someone would sue us, get a better lawyer and beat them. That's resisting an evil person. And the thing about it is, is whenever we're in a fight with an evil person the, and we win, what does that make us? It isn't anything for us to overcome or be better at being evil than the other person is. God's called us to rise above those things. The stories are some of the things that were mentioned about the early Christians and the, those that were martyrs. They didn't just become a martyr the moment they were presented the test of whether they were going to go through the fire or not. They lived this way before they got to that test. You know, we, uh, the idea that, you know, we, we think of big tests sometimes, or we think of something going to happen and we get all scared about it. And we get overcome and overwhelmed with some of these things. But the way that we climb mountains is one step at a time. The way that we find victory in overcoming these things that look so big to us. You know, the, it was mentioned about the boys that were, were apprehended before they were baptized and they were gonna be tried, thrown in jail and then burned. We could just look at something like that and think, wow, I, I could never do something like that. That'd be so difficult. The way we have the strength and courage to obtain the things that we look up to and appreciate is being faithful where we are today. You know, the little things that come our way. Someone asked ask us to go a little extra. Boy, we don't want to do it. And so we fight it and we resist. And we figure out a way that we don't have to do it. Well, we're not gaining. You know, what if something really, someone really put a real test on us? You know, if someone held a gun to our head and, well, are you a Christian? Or someone said, if you profess to be a Christian or if you don't deny the Lord, I'll throw you in jail. And you'll have to be there for 10 years in prison. You know, we think, oh yeah, I, I'd, I'd gladly do something like that. But then the little steps that the Lord puts in for, someone just goads us. Someone just asks us to do more than we're supposed to. And it really aggravates us and we just don't do it. If we don't know how to take these little steps, we won't be prepared whenever a real test comes along. You know, it's a blessing. Sometimes we think someone asks us to do something else or asks us to go a little further, stay a little longer. It just really goads us. But instead of looking at it as something that gets under our skin, Look at it like, here's an opportunity. Here's a chance to take a step. Whenever someone slaps us on the right cheek, turn 
to the other, turn the other also. In other words, give them the opportunity to take advantage of us again. No one likes that. It's not too pleasant. But it's an exercise for us. It's an opportunity to strengthen us. You know, like I said, we all would hope that we would be faithful. We read about the martyrs and the things they went. We would all, we admire them, their courage and their strength. Well, their courage and their strength came because they did their homework of everyday living. You know, I was, remember the story of a man that was, he was in a garden. Some, I don't, even, I don't remember his name right now, but he was, he was in a garden. And a man came up to him and just said, if you had only 24 hours to live, what would you do? And the man, without any hesitation, said, well, first I would finish this row that I'm working on. You know, if I would ask us, or if we would ask ourselves, if you knew that the Lord was going to return tomorrow, if you knew that tomorrow the Lord would return, or if you knew that you would only have 24 hours to live, on this earth. Let's think about it just a minute. This is your last 24 hours. What would you do different in those 24 hours? If you knew that the Lord was going to return tomorrow, how would you live the next 24 hours? Would you change a lot of things? Would you try to fix everything right quick? Because you're not prepared? One of the things of, that distinguishes a Christian is that their mind is in eternity. They're already living like they're going to be living forever. It's just something that we should ask ourselves pretty regularly. How would I change? What would I change if I knew tomorrow was my last day on earth? Today was my last day on earth. Would I have a lot of stuff to quick get in order? Or am I ready? The way we prepare to be ready is to be facing the little stuff, taking the little things. I mean, if, if we've seen some things happening in the world just changed within the last couple of years, just things are, that are going on that we never imagined would have happened. Things that I've heard about growing up that these things are going to happen in the last days. And we see it just happening right in front of our eyes. People, common sense doesn't mean a thing to most people anymore. They follow the mob or they follow the, the things that are going on around, and just completely oblivious to what's real. And there's no real thought of tomorrow. It's just what we can get out of today. Things could change in a hurry. And if our, if we have a lot of unpacked baggage, if we're, we have a lot of things that well, I wish I would have corrected them. Or I wish I would have fixed this. Or I wish I would have fixed that. Because the Bible talks about when Jesus returns, it'll be when people aren't expecting him to. Most people don't get a long time to think about they're going to die pretty soon, pretty quick. 
know, if we need to remember to live like we're dying. We need to remember to live like we only have one or two days left. And the thing about it is, is that shouldn't make us sad. That shouldn't make us afraid. What are we living for? So what if someone takes advantage of us? So what if someone doesn't treat us right? The Bible says if an evil person you don't resist an evil person. It's not a good person we're resisting. It says don't resist an evil person. What does it matter if someone takes advantage of us? Are we living like this might be my last day? I'm not saying just go get all religious all of a sudden. But learn to live one step at a time and being faithful at the step that's right in front of us. That man with the garden, he needed to, it was his responsibility to finish the row he was working on. Do you think he wasn't prepared for anything that would come after that? Such a simple thing just to finish the row that he had. He would have been prepared for anything that would come along because he was just working on one, weeding one little row of garden. That's all he had to do. He was prepared. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your body a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When someone slaps you on the cheek or takes advantage of you, to fight them back is to be conformed to this world, is to lower yourself to their level. But to transform your mind, but to be transformed is to rise above it, like what Christ asked. Sure, bothers us. Sure, we get irritated sometimes when someone asks more of us than what we really want to give. Time, whatever it is. But be transformed by it instead of being conformed by it. Anybody can get mad. Anybody can gripe and bellyache, complain. Say, oh, I shouldn't have to do this. I've already done my part. We can conform or we can be transformed. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be a disciple, is to be transformed by these opportunities that God gives to us instead of conforming to how the world would react and respond. So when these things that irritate us come along, we can do one of two things. We can conform to them, just like the world does. You know, the natural thing to react, respond, fix it, conform. Or we can allow this opportunity to transform us 
by the renewing of our minds. See, the things that we don't like are opportunities, choices to be conformed or transformed. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. See, what a lot of times whenever someone takes advantage of us, we begin to think we're a little better than that. We're a little over. We don't deserve that because I'm, I'm more important than that. I'm bigger than all of that. I don't have to put up with that. For just as we have many members in one body and all members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly to the proportion of his faith. Skip on over here. Now I'll just go ahead and read. If service in his servicing, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, or he who gives with liberal, liberality, liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without hypocrisy, Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You know, this is, these are some of these things that we love to see in other people. We we uh, expect to be treated nice by other people. And this is one of those things that if our focus was on just being what we are supposed to be, it doesn't really matter how we're treated because we don't really expect whenever we think of ourselves more highly than we ought we're expecting other people to treat us better and when they don't we get all upset and so then we decide well we don't need to be doing that too but if we treat everybody the way we should be treated or the way we would want them to be and don't worry about how they treat us but everyone just takes care of their own responsibility, then it will all work together. But when we get to the place where, well, he's not quite doing what he ought to do, and that upsets me, well, that throws a whole wrench in the whole program. But whenever I just take care of myself, and if someone does do me wrong, or someone doesn't treat me quite the way I ought to, well, I don't expect any better, I'm going to still do my part. I'm still going to return and do what I'm supposed to be doing in all of this. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. And it says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. 
But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. <clears throat> overcome evil with good. You know, I've heard people say, that, well, I'm going to do this and the Lord will repay him. That is just disguised evil. There's nothing good about that. That hasn't lifted us above anything. Jesus, with the people who were crucifying, said, Father, forgive them. He didn't say, Father, forgive them, because I know you're going to smack them. He said, Father, forgive them. Stephen, when he was being stoned, said, Father, forgive them. Not because he hoped that God would pour his wrath upon them, but because he wanted them forgiven. Because he had forgiven them. This all happens by taking the little things, the little steps that God, the little inconveniences, the little slaps, the little ask, the little things that we just don't want to do but instead of letting them transform us or conform us to the world, let them transform us so that we can live that way, that we can live each day like it was our last, so that we can live each day like it might be the day the Lord returns. And we won't be scurrying around late. Scurrying around trying to quickly make preparations. The five foolish virgins had to scurry around to get the preparations made. By the time they got ready to go, the Lord had already come and went and the door was shut. What do you have to do to be ready? Is there a whole bunch of stuff that you neglected, let go, things you're too busy to take care of? Whenever it's our last day, whether by death or the Lord returning, all those things we're so busy with, they'll go right on without us. May the Lord add his blessings. This week we're supposed to bring a teaching from the early Christians that kind of went along with the sermon last Sunday. And I just thought it was neat how for the first thousand years it was completely accepted, like Brother David said, it was completely accepted the idea that Jesus had died to overcome Satan and bring us out of captivity. But then one man decided that, or thought that it was probably that he had just died to, died to appease God and it changed how most people think nowadays. It's just amazing what one man can do to change everybody else's thought process. I was reading Brian Gray's book about early church writings and I found they find themselves in the flesh and yet they live not after the flesh. Their existence is on earth but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the established laws yet they surpass the laws in their own lives. They love all men, and they are persecuted by all. They are ignored, and yet they are condemned. They are put to death, and yet they are endued with life. And I thought it was just kind of neat that they are just normal people living in whatever country they lived in, and they 
spoke the same language as everybody else and lived with them, but they were uh, not going after worldly things and they're going for a higher calling. It's just kind of neat. I also got something from Brian Gray's uh, concordance here. Um, for happiness consists not in lordship over one's neighbors, nor in desiring to have more than weaker men, nor in possessing wealth and using force to inferiors. Neither can anyone imitate God in these matters. Nay, these lie outside, lie outside his greatness. And most people, um, human nature is to um, want to be rich and famous and be above everyone else. And, but that's not the way that... To, that's not the way to happiness. True, true happiness is when we can um, live for God and for others and for helping others and not for ourselves. The only Christians knew when they wanted to follow Jesus that they had to make several sacrifices. One thing I really appreciate about the early Christians was they didn't try to put their doctrine in a box and they just kept learning things and changing and that's something we try to do like they did. There's a lot of people nowadays that you can ask them what their denomination believes and they can fill your ear basically on everything. They've got it all figured out, all written down just so that it doesn't change but it's like they've hit a ceiling. They can't go anything above that, can't learn anything past that. The early Christians taught non-resistant and how we need to love those who hate us. And Jesus is a perfect example for that. Like he, when he was persecuted, he loved loved all those who were persecuting him just as much as he loved anyone else. I just got a little bit here in Romans 13. Every person is to be in subjection to government governing authorities for there is no for there is no authority except from God and those who exist are established by God Who's, therefore whosoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God and and they who know and they who have opposed the um and they who and they who have reposed, opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Um, for, um, for rules are, I might just stop. Well, for rules are not the case of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do not, do you want to have no fear or authority. Anyways, um, it's just um, neat you. God, God put us here and. He gave. He is the authority of us, so he established us, and so he's the authority of us. Uh, the early Christians had to live by faith. They never knew where they would end up the next day. They might be in prisons and chains, and or they might be, you know, just doing their living their day to day life. And um, in Hebrews 11, and also others experienced mocking, scourging, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with a sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the earth. And all these things, having gained approval through their faith, that did not receive what was promised, because God has provided something better for us, so that apart from us they would not be made perfect. So, you know, they just worked their daily lives and lived by faith to get to a better land. One thing that I've always found... Uh, great from the other Christians, their way of sacrificing, you know, basically anything to, uh, you know, their lives for, you know, fellow <clears throat> brothers or whatever. I, when I was younger, there's a story my mom used to always read to us about these three boys who uh, were on their way 
to go get baptized and they had to stop in at the, the uh, Tanner's place to get some hide stand and uh, the constables stopped them and uh, they, were end up, they ended up going to jail and being uh, burned to death and uh, um, it was just instead of being baptized by water, uh, they said they were baptized by fire and I just kind of think that in today's world I don't, especially for me, I don't know how I don't know how I would be able to, you know, withstand, you know, all these persecutions and everything. Uh, it just shows how, you know, I sometimes feel like we have it hard these days, but in reality, I think this is, there are hardships out there, but I think in today's age, it's actually, we kind of had it easier than a lot of people did back then. And the early church say, Sometimes they had to like just worship together in a boat, in a small boat, because of persecution and stuff. And it says in in Brian's book how if there's two or three gathered together in the Lord's name, then then He's with them. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to read a short passage from uh, Wisdom of Sirach, chapter 30, verse uh, 21 through 24. So, do not give yourself over to sorrow, and do not distress yourself deliberately. Gladness of the heart is the life of man, and rejoicing by a man lengthens his, de- his life. Love your soul, comfort your heart, put Sorrow far away from you, for sorrow has destroyed many, and there is no profit in it. Envy and anger will shorten your days, and worry will bring premature old age. A man with good a man with a good and cheerful heart will pay attention to the food he eats. And I was reading through this this morning, and uh, just was thinking in in life, you know you worrying about all these things that are going around, you know, what's happening, you know, uh, on the news or, you know, even what's happening in, in our everyday lives. And I uh, heard Uncle David say many times the only thing you can control in life is your attitude. And, and uh, I just, I need to be better about just uh, trusting that God has a plan and uh, don't, you know, not not be anxious and and uh, just getting stressed out over things that that really don't matter. Um, you know, all our days are are numbered, and and it's good for me to slow down and think. Uh, you know, if if today is my last day, would this that I'm stressed about would would it really even matter? You know, and that's it's it's good for me to. Uh, think about that and and just slow down and and remember what's really important in life and and uh, remember why we're here and try to remember my purpose. But that's all I had. Thank you.
See?